GM, uh, GM to all the crypto folk. We're doing another walkthrough today. Um, uh, Blockswap Labs walkthrough. Um, we got a few of them now, and uh, we're going to talk about something quite exciting now. Um, so if you uh have followed along the um what's happening in proof of stake ethereum post merge uh one of the things that you'll be you may have heard of or you may know about from first hand experience if you're a node runner uh running an ethereum validator in in the proof of stake era of ethereum is the uh validator proxy software known as mev boost so MEV Boost was introduced uh, not long after the merge. There was some delay after the merge actually uh, kicked in before MEV Boost was activated. And the idea is, um, you know, the 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 general high level idea, um, you know, accurate or not, is to um, that instead of a proposer constructing a block themselves locally. They um, where they will uh, collect uh, transactions from a mempool, um, produce a valid Ethereum block. They would outsource this job to uh, an external entity called a builder. And a uh, builder and relayer would do some communication uh, via, um, sorry, builder and proposer would uh, communicate together via a relay software. Now, the validate proxy software, the, the MEV boost, is there to serve as the the software so, uh, for proposal builder separation. So um, in that respect, um, MEV Boost is offering a single application for, for validators. So, um, and it has a, a certain construction um, and is only designed to operate with relays and it, we, we have only, like I say, one kind of application. And, um, that has allowed some validators to earn additional income on uh, their consensus lay income. So you have, as a validator, you have different income streams, um, starting with the um, Ethereum consensus layer inflation rewards for um, performing a, a consensus layer uh, duties, such as attestations um, and um, block production, that sort of thing. Um, their additional revenue streams, the the only the, the core additional revenue stream that was activated post merge was execution layer income, uh, which was going to Ethereum miners under proof of work before that. And um, you know, validators that are sometimes looking for additional yield may activate the software for uh for further income. But actually the reality of the space is evolving and um the you know the narrative is you know it it's you know obviously changing all the time um but there is new opportunities for validators to uh create additional incomes um through rev uh, through paths such as restaking and 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 that sort of thing so how do we cater to this new world you know is really what we want to sort of discuss here in the context of of mev plus and mev plus is a um an alternative software being proposed by um by Blockswap um and that can be plugged into your standard uh, builder APIs and and uh, validator consensus software and gives a new meaning to what we commonly know as MEV but we want to not refer it to it as extractable value but more expressible value um and we can definitely deep dive into what that means in, in greater detail. Um, the software is one side, but there is a whole, um, there is a whole, you know, other side of, of why it is needed really, and why it is beneficial for, uh, for Ethereum really, or its decentralization and strength as a network, you know, <clears throat> MEV plus, for example, is coming as an MIT software. It's a, it's a public benefit good, right? So I'm trying to get, a gist of this, right? Um, mm -hmm. MEV plus stands for maximal expressive value, which is a um, a kind of a communication bridge towards Ethereum consensus layer validators, right? From, you know, the execution layer, or it could yeah. be from anywhere outside, right? Anyone who is from outside want to communicate with the validators in the it's consensus layer, this is a kind of a framework 
you can add multiple sidecar mechanisms. So it's like if it's a, it's basically a framework that that gets you a, a core communication um, um, channel with the, the validators that you want to communicate at any given point of time for whatever the reason. It could be for block building, it could be for restaking, it could be for uh, you know any other stuff, right? Anything that you want to reuse as validators. So in the block building, what do you use for the validators? You use for signing the blocks, right? And this is very interesting because um, you know the latest proposal, like um, the forward inclusion list, um, it, it opens up the design space for epoch level auctions and things like that. If it's you could do it, like you get like thirty two proposers at a, at an epoch, and then you can just start doing things. And as we go into Enshrine PPS, like you know. Um, a list of the proposal, and you can you can simulate what would be the gas limit for each in the you know for that next thirty two, and then you can start like you know having more predictable metering for the pricing and rewards and everything. Uh, but you really need to have more subjective, expressive um, um, uh, logics to be implemented there. Um, right, and I feel I feel like the like the what you're saying is like. The, the uh, when you look at things from an Ethereum execution layer perspective, like it is easy to make consensus layer blind spots, like and it, w when it's actually like one of the most important part of the chains, right? It's kind of like it's it's the the only reason that the execution layer is able to function, right? But we don't have, um, but but there is there is all the focus all all the time at the execution layer. But what is securing the execution layer is really important here, and how can that be reused elsewhere? In the sidecar execution ecosystem, right, right, right. So that's 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 very interesting because, um, hmm. yeah, because it's sidecar is very very effective because you're running a software along with your validator client, right, and it allows you to to do many things, and it really depends. This also comes with a lot of challenges. This, yeah, um, we want to. I want to know more about like. How do you listen to those communications, right? And th there's obviously there's a lot of communication overhead here, right? It's network overhead, messaging overhead. Would would it get an n square problem, right? I mean, that's the maximum that you can get. Like, and everyone talks to everyone. Just, but is it is some sort of a listening mechanism there? Topic based listening or channels or and uh, there could be bulletin boards that can propagate things, and then you you know the validators decide who they want to to listen, and they configure that. Or you know things like you don't get spammed, you don't get this kind of noisy environment, like you know, um, when the framework comes. Right. So let's dive into it, and we can go along and ask questions. Would that would that make sense? Yeah. Well, I think I think yeah. I think just before we 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 touch upon that, I think um, it might be useful to to um, you know give a sort of. Like a bit of a, a, a technical introduction to this to uh, MEP plus and um, maybe talk about like the flagship application of of it. So, um, yeah. so you know, um, MEP plus will will create a whole new, uh, as we've said before, a whole new sidecar ecosystem for for validators, um, and will allow for um applications that are both off-chain you know block buildings and off-chain application and also on-chain applications where validators are able to talk with the execution layer natively um in an automated fashion and uh, that brings about whole new classes of, of of applications and new income streams for 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 validators themselves and so this demands in order to do this it demands a new architecture for a software that interacts with the uh, the validator clients over the builder API, um, and um, uh, one that is um, sort of open and but also modular. So m modularity means extensibility, and also it means anybody can come and build new classes of MEV aware protocols that may require a validator element as well as a smart contract element. And MEV Plus will bring BLS state to the execution mm. layer. 
So this is like how the the uh, the client came, the you know the consensus layer clients were you know very we have a diverse set of clients right now in the consensus layer, but there is a mm. base framework core framework that has been given to them. How do you communicate? How do you store this? And uh, what do you want to do, etc. Yada yada yada. I mean, is that well, exactly is that, is that the same theory uh, that or framework that it follows here? Yeah, a hundred percent. That being aligned with that as close as possible is 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 ultimately the goal. So a common specification that everybody works on and agrees to, and multiple imp implementations in different languages. So we are going to present uh, an implementation in GoLang. Obviously, GoLang and Ethereum they uh, they go really well together. Um, and uh, you know, pieces of software like Geth are the backbone of Ethereum. So, um, but, you know, uh, multiple implementation brings about, um, you know, redundancy and um, means that the, that the network can continue to operate um, even if there is a fault in one of the clients. So if there's a fault in one of the MEV plus implementations, if there are multiple implementations in, in languages built by anybody, right? Because if it's open, anybody can build it, you know, it doesn't mean one entity has to build it all, right? So. Um, you know, then um, then we have really a stronger a stronger network. And and the other thing um, that uh, Ronnie and Vijay will probably touch upon in more detail is how we can support actually multiple validator clients to a single MEV uh, plus software. So you may um, you know if you're thinking from maybe a DVT perspective, or if you want you know you have like you want to set up more resilient. Uh, 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 infrastructure, but you want to use a common a common um, portal to you know the sidecar execution ecosystem. You can do that with MEV plus if you want to do that. So it brings about you know oh, yeah, that, a lot of things. Nice. Oh, that's nice because DVTs are basically uh, you know distributed infrastructure for signing messages, right? And they they have their own consensus. SSV and Auble and all this kind of guys, you could use them to do all kind of credible commitment scheme like decryptions and things like that. And, you know, some sort of a rolling over committees and things. Wow, this is this is awesome. I mean, if, if they, they, they come to life in, in, in a full-fledged manner, they could basically plug in and say that, hey, this is it. This is our topics. We, we offer this and that service. You know, we have, you know, absolutely great liveness. You can, you can rely on us in this, Wow, this is this is really modular. Yeah. This is like a very yeah. much modular future of how the rollup centric future will come, right? You know, you can you can do an action in a rollup by having a signature from an Ethereum validator here in Ethereum, but you basically no, don't you don't really have any kind of on chain. You you talk to this sidecar. Exactly, and and in and uh, depending on the rollup, you might you might require a a, a zero knowledge uh, a, a module that can uh, handle zero knowledge proofs, or you might need a module that handles uh, a yeah. uh, programmable MPC. You know, we right. can you know any yeah. kind can be built. Even, even paymasters, right, for the bundles and account abstractions. Oh shit! All right, cool. So, but we we just need to go into detail when we talk about all this feature, how it will not overload, it will just be simple as a framework. You only in integrate what you need. You don't really have to worry about other things as an ecosystem. So it's kind of a sidecar ecosystem, like an app store. You you download whatever you want, and then you just deal with that. You, some some of them you use it quite often, some of them you don't. You know, Some of them are really critical. You want to have certain security features inside. Right, okay, cool. I mean, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, maybe, maybe Ronnie, like we can, we can start off. Like, um, we can go into more technical details, and and uh, then we can move to VJ talking about some of the modules that have been written. Uh, the just you know the base modules that any you know, the the ones that are standard. Before yeah. before getting, in, I love to see like in some sometime in the future when the the uh, the Cancun comes in the data blob. You know, you can't actually see the data blob signature because you know data blob also have this kind of a um they have um a committee right uh yes I, but this is this is all possible uh, oh yeah awesome. yeah that's yeah. true yeah yeah cool cool all right let's begin i don't want to complicate <laughs> yeah 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 and we've got to talk about auctions as well why why oh, auctions yeah. are important and maybe a plus right oh yeah we need an auction for god's sake we just need an auction for any at least one please so what is what is your you know, from your perspective, what 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 
um, what is the environment required for an auction? An auction like the, should have, yeah. you know, uh, it should either, you know, fall into one of two, two categories or DSIC or Bayesian or whatever it is, incentive compatibility. Like by default, an auction should have um, a neutral auctioneer, first of all, right? The auctioneer should not interfere in it. So you could do that in a public, you know, public board so everyone can see what the auctioneers do it. But most important is the time bound. So everyone has an opportunity to place their bid and it's a fair game. And the auction should have some, the desiderata for auction is like, how do you create a private valuation of the bidder is incompatible with the social welfare of the auction itself. That means everyone just, whatever that's been put for the auction, the party, the, 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 the end result will benefit the party who want to sell and the party who want to buy. And most often, uh, the party will be one party to who to sell it in, in, in terms of block building. And the parties who want to buy will be like more than N. So you have N number of parties going after a, a, a particular block, right? So in this case, everyone should have an opportunity. And then it opens up all kind of other problems like you know spamming, DDoS attack, and things like that. So you should have a limited, you have a limited window you should have fair and open way, and there should be a clear metering on the pricing. Metering is very important. And if you want to escalate the price, this is a you know, um, first price auction, second price auction, or ascending second price auction, and then you, you might have a sealed bid at the last, you know, all these things can, you can integrate as, as you want, but the basic framework is, there's a cutoff time, right? Otherwise it's not an auction. It's just a signaling. The signaling is like the street mechanism, right? So the early days, like you don't really deserve, what, you don't get paid what you deserve for. You only, you know, you only get paid for what you negotiate. But even if you don't have a chance to negotiate, what do you get paid for? Okay. It's it's manipulated, right? So then you're. It's like a someone. Nobody should be in a position of power. That's that's the auction, you know, you know, get to some sort of a fair mechanism. So everybody should have a chance, and it's based on the increasing of social welfare. And the party who is selling, you will get a fair price. The parties who is buying will get also fair price, not to get manipulated in between the auctioneer. So there should be a bound, a time limit, and then you just go and bid your things. And the bid value should be fair and open, should not be tampered, all this kind of stuff. But you can inject any kind of auction mechanism. Candle auction, English auction, Rickery auction, you name it, right? First price, second price, you know, escalating, discipline, Dutch auction, you know, inverse and you know, dynamic auction, whatever you want. Either so either e yeah, what regardless of the style, you need openness and you need credible commitments, you know, yeah. to yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And incentive compatibility. Right. Okay. That's very important. All right. Let's dive right. in then. All right, cool. Okay, um, so basically, MEV MEV plus acts as a almost like a middleware to explode the applications, um, of the consensus layer client, um, to other external, um, other external logic, other external applications you like to plug into your client and serve both um execution and consensus as well. But to start off, like in a general high level overview, MVV Plus offers the base tooling where, as a validator, you can, in following the builder API, you can serve the consensus layer by receiving external, um, externally built blocks, which can be validated and signed over for a proposal. So the idea behind MVV Plus is to have a very modular workflow to to this process um, to start off where we do follow the builder API spec, where we do follow the builder API spec um, for all consensus layer clients. So in the sense, allowing for the registration of validators, block um, proposals um, through submitting the binded blocks and receiving headers of choosing. Um, current implementation have have ingrained logic where 
um, headers are received from relays. But with the idea with MVV plus and its modular nature, you can more or less receive um, headers or blocks with different uh, data injected into the block as to your configuration to sign over and um, obtain that maximum expressible value you intend for. So in high level, the main the main components of MEV plus are the core and its modules. So the modules that come pre-built with MEV plus are the builder API to serve the validator, the block aggregator, which we'll get a bit deeper into, which more or less aggregates all of these blocks and data required for the validator um, proposals and the relay which comes pre-built with um, MEV plus. So in MEV plus's um, workflow, the idea is for every <clears throat> for every slot, a selected validator connected to a consensus layer client has an opportunity to propose a block. And in that block proposal opportunity, there's a request by the consensus layer client for an external header if if configured as such. This external header is where you, you would provide the proxy software, in this case, MV Plus's um, builder API serving um, URL to obtain this external header to value first, validate, and then sign over. Once, once gotten um, this header, there's a need to then propose um, the, the blinded header to receive the full execution payload to the consensus layer. And that's where the, the relay module comes from. So the relay module pre-built at least in, in this version of MEV plus obtains these headers from external relays um, as Matt had mentioned, and also obtains the full execution payload required by the consensus layer software to propose to the chain. The core is more or less truly the core for MEV plus. The idea behind the core is to configure all of these external pluggable modules for MEV plus to allow for this application and more. So to start off, MEV plus can is, is, is built relatively lightweight with modules you may or may not need. Um, and so there is a, as mentioned before, there is a modules list um, available with MEV plus, which we have built pre um, um, ready, ready modules for block aggregation and the builder API and to serve the relay. Now the core more or less handles the processing and the application starting of all of these modules and keeps the communication channels between these modules in sync and allows for notification of certain events across the whole software between all of these modules. The idea of building such a modular system is, is to allow for external, external projects, external applications, to build their own code, run being able to run your own service as a microservice within your folder and choosing as to when and how you want to serve your service to the entire infrastructure. So what the core does at its start, you would initially, of course, have to build MEV plus or you can run MEV plus directly through this entry file. Now in running MEV plus in accessing the CLI, all external modules aside the predefined modules can be defined within this modules file and then listed as a service within this module list service. What core does is core at runtime and in, in during its compilation would run through the available services you want to plug into your, your software and, and, and render to the validator software and then um, append all commands and microservice um, configurations you want to start at a runtime of the software. So as a project or as an application in building your MV plus software is as simple as listing your test service here, which must follow a certain spec. I would come into that. So in listing your test service here, you do not have to tamper with the, the, MV plus core software code at all. You don't need to tamper with any other modules and you don't need to um, spend that time learning or understanding 
the, the processing of other modules since the core more or less would would process the the logic within your module and expose available processes to other modules and to the validator client. So enlisting your your service here by importing from the right module that you've constructed, you can in a sense start your microservice along with the um, quote unquote validator proxy software. So in this sense, the validator is not only exposed to one form of tooling, but as many as can be listed here at a go. Similarly, the commands available unique to your, your service can be listed here um, to allow for um, very unique configurations for your uh, microservice and application, if that's the case. So enlisting your service here as, as done in test service, MVV Plus aims to provide a very simple spec that services must implement in order to, to um, be pluggable into the software. The idea is to ensure communication is done through a core client, which I'll get into, and also allow for configuration of your service. Every other thing is just to allow the starting and identification of your service or application or module that has been plugged into MEV+. So we aim to keep the service spec as lean as possible um, without too many restrictions in writing your particular module, but allow for this this required um this required interfaces in order for the core to manage and allow for communication between the different modules quite effectively. So to start off, how MEV plus um, performs the, the running of your software much more technically, um, the command line interface of MEV plus initiates the default um, module CLI commands for the builder API, the relay and aggregator that have come um, pre-packaged with MEV plus and unpacks the each command flag and checks for conformity to a certain namespace that your module is registered under. So every module, in this case, the Builder API is registered under a certain namespace, in this case, the Builder API namespace. So the module name for this package is the, the Builder API. Similarly for Relay has its own module name and aggregator. These namespaces allow for core identification and for message notification and calls within the entire um, application so that messages and events can be passed correctly to the required uh, modules and the validator proxy software as well. And so in, in processing the, the module flags um, or through the CLI, what, what PLUS does is it intends to create the MEV PLUS core, which I'll come into much more detail, and then configure the core and its, its required services um, at the start of the program. So to clear, you can run MVV plus by running the go build. So as mentioned before, MVV plus go, you could build MVV plus into a binary available for you to copy into, let's say your, your globally accessible binary to use more, much more easily. But in this case, plus is configured to, again, access all the commands within all connected modules and allow you, for instance, the Relay module to configure your entire software through one entry point. So for Relays, you can configure setting nodes you want to connect to, setting networks you are running, setting, um, BLS public keys that the, the, the node is connected to and you want to validate. As well, similarly for black block aggregators, which I would explain much more deeply, you can configure much more complex um, bidding logic and um, auction processes or much more complex validation methods for, for blocks that you collect and then pass to your validator proxy software. So this offers, this acts as like the parking lot for all slot headers, um, data blobs, um, all other sidecar imp um, implementations to which would process in much more higher level logic for the best um, value to the, the validator software. 
as mentioned before, we 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 can prepackage with the builder API, which more or less is a server to serve this validator proxy software. And so in in the same way, plus um allows for the 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 processing of all these flags from each of the modules. I will just simply show you the block aggregator module as to how you can configure your module to, to expose these flags to the entire software. So in registering your namespace, you can of course add CLI descriptions to what your module actually implements or implement that module directly. So I could in a sense run MV plus straight without running the entire software and just run a block aggregator just to see and process the logic within that block aggregator software. And so you have your own command line um, interface and command line commands that you can execute and flags and flags you can configure and include. So this is kind of the, the spec you may follow in your particular module to configure your service for MEV+. And so upon um, configuration, the, the, the logic behind the core is to prepare every module to start as both a module that can communicate in a microservice that can render its own functionality. So the we will take the block aggregator again as an example. So the block aggregator as a service renders very very simply data and con connected block sources that it collects blocks from, as I mentioned, like a parking lot for all of the data that is coming into the software. And so depending on your microservice, what MEV um, Plus's core would do, would it would instantiate its core, con prepare the configurations required for your block aggregator service in this case, or your uh, module, and then pass the configurations to your module. Bearing in mind that may, um, many applications or projects would have very um, unique, um, unique configurations and unique instances to to what you're, they are doing or unique signatures and private keys to be passed, core ensures that none of this is exposed externally to any other pluggable software or pluggable module. And so every configuration um, that you may pass is not actually exposed to any other module and is specific to your, your, your module through one entry point in the CLI. And so upon configuration, the core starts its its own service and then starts its additional services within any module that has a microservice infrastructure. So in starting the core, delving much more deeper into the core code outside of the CLI, in starting the core, the core registers modules. So the module registration, there is a more intricate um, step or integrate process to registering modules that the core actually performs in identifying not only what the module name is, but what the module can do and can execute. So I would um, come into that. So in starting your module, you will start the module services, which more or less scans through every module that is capable of running a microservice and configures their one con after configuring a particular module, can run your own microservice. Um, and let's say if you are serving an another um, HTTP port for something else, or let's say seven PON, um, serving a conventional relay module, it will start all of these microservices by ensuring that none of them are blocking from the entire course workflow. After starting- Is this- yeah. Is this, sorry to interrupt you, Ronnie. Uh, it's very interesting. Is this where the flags get passed through or like am I jumping ahead? Like... Um, actually the flags get passed through when the core is configuring its own service and its uh, okay. its module services. So the... It's all namespaced and stuff like that. So you can you can have like, uh, you know, you can have flags for specific modules and, and yeah. But I guess yeah. you're going to get into that and, and the, cool. Yeah, that's correct. So for the core here, um, and this is like the module registry. Before you get to start the core, that's what mentioned here. You have a configuration by the core. So what the core does is the module flags for each module is configured to all the the, the different pluggable modules. 
and then a communication pipeline is established between these modules. So the core in, um, more or less adopts the RPC methodology to communication, but in process. So it does not expose this communication uh, pipelines outside of the, the, the core module itself. And the, and the communication channels themselves cannot be directly accessed by other, um, other modules um, to leak data or to compromise communication between these modules. So the core instantiates a call client to establish this communication and then ensures that no module can, can create this sort of communication between the core and the module or the module and another module by, by creating this client and um, producing a unique identifier or signature in this case to that specific module that the module must return back with a ping. So the, the core in connecting to this module client by that identifier is able to ensure that the connection is originating from the core's configuration and then can safely append the, the module and its um, written functions into the functionality of MEV+. So this is what happens in the core setting up its communication client and configuring each module that's connected to it. So the, as mentioned before, the ping generates a unique ID to which the core uses in connecting the, the that specific client. Um, if you do quite remember the spec, um, these clients must follow. Let me just go back to the spec. So the spec in connecting the core would provide the core clients that has been configured uniquely by the core and a unique um, ping identifier to connect that client to the core. Now modules must must be able to receive this core client as this is the means of communication to the core and to other modules as well. There is no direct function execution between one um, one module and another, considering that it's very modular and there are some. Um, there are some modules that require, let's say, much more complex um, packages or much more complex functions. And to write and understand th those function executions would be uh, much more a load or a, le a steeper learning curve for anybody want that wants to expand the application of MV+. And so this, this core client that has been created and configured by the core is more or less your gateway to every other application within MV+. And so once this unique handshake is, is done, the core identifies the, the client channels that have been verified um, through the client that the core created and keeps track of these um, channels for, relay, um, for relaying communications between different modules and between the module and the core itself. So that's, that's what happens prior to the core starting. So a wrong configuration um, would be alerted and would will be flagged before the whole core is even started. So you won't have the case where a client, um, sorry, a, a module has written some um, a configuration quite wrongly, and then you start and then mid process, because it's a communication channel, you can't more or less directly validate um, the, the structure of every function you're executing. The core in configuration does that check for you. And so there's the, is, although th this, this opens room for, um, let's say your syntax, your syntax checks not directly working in writing your functions. The, the core is still able to fill in that gap by by ensuring that functions written um, to connect to the core and the required modules um, are of course correct and then are and can be added as callbacks um, to the client software. Um, yes. So back to actually starting these services as mentioned before in in, in maintaining a, a registry by the core. The core has this identifier and has this unique handshake um, and, and manage clients between each of these modules. And aside that can also, uh, having established this, this communication being started, it can also run microservices that are unique to these certain clients. And so the Builder API for one is a microservice that will be serving the validator proxy software um, the relay to is a microservice that would perform its own, let's say, cleanups and other functionality. And so these can all be started aside the, the fact that these modules will be communicating within um, within the, the, the software and across each other. And so in in in, in the core handling, the, the, the starting of these module microservices, there's an initial need to register 
your your module and so what happens in module registration is the core takes the namespace and then the service spec which you have followed and more or less scans through your your package your your module package so let's say block aggregator the core more or less will scan through the service file um wrappers or func methods around the the particular service spec you followed for methods that you'd wish to expose um, to other clients and to the module itself that can be executed by passing arguments through an RPC um, met, um, spec we've, we've written out. And so um, in, in scanning through, yeah, the core more or less finds suitable callbacks, almost similar to how, if you think about it, how um, RPC methods work more widely in, um, let's say, Go Ethereum um, by um, more or less exposing certain namespaces to certain function methods that you can execute. Similarly, in identifying callbacks, um, in this case, all callbacks are, are not too strictly enforced to either be a subscription method or a normal function execution, but all callbacks which are public and not privatized and follow an error return spec or a data return spec would be attached within um, this particular module. So to I to to give um context, if let's say the um here we have the block aggregator which has these this service function, all of these methods for the name to connect core to connect block sources, all of these methods around the block aggregator service can be understood by the core by scanning more or less through your whole modules package and then exposing the function, which in this case you have made public and it's required arguments and, and, and necessary um, errors or um, results or payloads that you would return. So that's essentially what the core does in registering your your namespace, and it flags any any um, errors that may not be suitable for the entire software infrastructure. But as as mentioned before, the the restriction is very light, such that it can allow flexibility to, for anyone to code whatever they actually want to code, um, but still ensure your your module service methods return in the in the right format and is connected to your core client. So. Going back to the core and how it starts. So anything, um, again, since all of these are microservices, as I've mentioned, in, in um, being started by the core, the core, again, can be one single entry point to stop um, any and all microservices that you wish. And so the, the management of your entire software, your entire um, application is re relatively easier um, due to the modular nature and the single point of entry through the MV plus core. And so in in, in case of any fatal issues, the core has um, that functionality to, to stop and manage these services and manage your, your memory and system resources quite um, efficiently and would be improved as, as we plug in more modules with time. And so much more detailed into the full workflow of the 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 current application we're offering um mv plus as we was we can start from the core more or less relaying messages through the relay comms between any module for each of the modules that you've plugged between any module and its targeted module and also the ability for the module to notify all other connected modules of certain events that have happened. Um, so in a sense, you can more or less have your validator call for registration um, to a relay, but your execution layer module would know of this registration call and let's say update your, your module registry on chain for this validator to certain relay um, parties. Um, it can do uh, certain checks for you within that um, other external module as it has been notified of this particular event that has been triggered by the consensus layer client. Other events can be notified across different modules and, and specified to certain modules uh, with, with 
um, wait times for certain callbacks um, or you can ignore certain responses if it's something you just want to notify the entire software about. And so this, this, this helps create the auction, right? Yes. That we were describing earlier. Yes. So in a sense, when a validator comes for the block header, um, every pluggable module can know of this event for the need for a header and thus have the the fair opportunity to present the right block or the right date, um, data for the validator um, that is requesting for the header. And so the block aggregator is where the, the logic will be built from time to time, much more complex. And you can even take that complex logic out of the block aggregator into your own module where um, you can perform that complex logic before passing to the block aggregator um, module itself, which will serve the builder API. So here I would I would just give the, the workflow. So we go from builder API serving the validator to the block aggregator, which more or less is the basket for all of the data that will be collected and processed. And then the relay, as mentioned, is just one of many sources of data to the to the validator through the block aggregator. So I could hand over to VJ who could um, walk you through like the very entry point into MVV plus for the validator um, client software, in this case, your consensus client software, whether that be it Lighthouse, Prism, mm -hmm. um, whatever software you have configured for your validator client um, would be the entry point as builder API and VJ could, could walk through that that um, specific module. Yeah, thanks, Rane. Uh, so I would like to talk about like, uh, let me share my screen first. Yes. So now we will talk about build API. So like, uh, as we are already discussing how our ME plus works, uh, how is our project architectured and how core is our integral part and how we are having communication. So now we are talking about which module is separate and how, what is the role of each module and its purpose and how it is helping us to run the better product basically. So let's start with the Builder API. Uh, builder API, plays a very pivotal role within our MV plus project. It is basically a service that provides a REST API to build blocks. Uh, uh, let me show you the code. So this is some of the builder API spec that we already know. Uh, it serves as an entry point. Builder API is serving as an entry point for proposers into our system. Uh, this API builder API module is used for handling requests and obtaining responses from within the system. Now, with the help of our core, builder API is able to initiate RPC calls uh, to proper module uh, on uh, requesting on, on whenever a proposer is making a request. So we have some uh, APIs here, which we will discuss now. Uh, before that, uh, let me give more introduction about Builder API. So this module can be initialized with some specific configurations like uh, listener address, logger set, and so we have defined them in our config flags, uh, which are needed for the initialization of this product. And after the initialization with the help of these flags, uh, Builder API is uh, ready to go. For uh, incoming managing incoming request, HTTP request builder API is using MUX. Uh, it is establishing routes and endpoints with the help of MUX routers. These routes uh, basically define various HTTP endpoints, which is dedicated to a specific function. Uh, for this function, let's start with handle root function. So handle root function is basically giving a description to our service, like what is our builder API and how it works. And after that, uh, we have this handle status function here. Uh, handle status function is uh, like an endpoint. It's an endpoint which retrieves the system status by communicating with the core client and engaging with the block aggregator module in the process. We will uh, talk about more when we will go into block aggregator module. 
uh, this uh, handle status basically gives uh, status along how the system is active or it's down. If there is no issue, then it will return OK. Otherwise, it will do the run, which I will do. After this, we have uh, one more uh, a call, which is handle register validation. So this function will be used just to register the validator mainly. Uh, to register a validator, uh, it is a post request call, uh, which will uh, receive the data. And it will uh, also call the register by block, block aggregator register validator. And uh, registration will happen on block aggregator and how we will make more RPC calls from block aggregator to the relay module. Uh, we will talk about it. So this whole of our builder API is basically just an uh, hyper we can say where we are just uh, calling different different modules with the help of code. And uh, mm, let's uh, uh, we can talk about each endpoint on handle get header and uh, handle get payload. So handle get header is also like uh, taking request from the taking person uh, taking request and then decoding the data and uh, using a core again to call the block aggregator doing and handle get payload doing the same. Uh, apart from uh, this API handling, we can uh, discuss more about like errors. We are uh, using error handling vector for that. Uh, that's all we can talk about uh, much uh, for builder API. It's just a wrapper, wrapper service to call block aggregator manually to uh, uh, using harnessing uh, our uh, core module so it can uh, call uh, block aggregator. Yeah, uh, you can, uh, I want to even if you add more on this, I think uh, that's all as for builder yeah. API. Yeah, we can uh, talk about block aggregator and then we can talk about relay in detail, I think. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as, as, as we've gone through with, um, the builder API. The builder API is in a sense your entry point into the MVV plus software by the validator client. And so returning back to, to what the builder API would access um as as gone through with BJ, your core client that has been created by the the core and configured for communication. Um here would enable you through the builder API APIs to make calls to any module um, specified here. So again, I want to say that these these three modules come uh, at least managed um, within the software and, and, and packaged within the software. And any other module you want to include um, can be listed here and then attached as a module list without having to go through too much code within the core. And so for, for a module um, to access and send um, data across and execute certain functions, you would more or less specify that module or that namespace and the function you want to execute. So um, as, as I'd gone through how, as to how the core learns about your module and more or less processes the callbacks, which are, in a sense are the functions of your module, there's a registry of functions that the core would instantiate with just using the names the name of the method you're trying to execute or the name of the function you're trying to execute the core with this registry of or this knowledge of functions that are available or services that are available with, within each module can instantiate a, a, a an environment to execute that particular function for you safely uh, without crashing the whole software and so in executing this function any arguments passed this is a unlimited list. You can keep passing as many arguments depending on the, the particular function. The, the call client call will allow for arguments to be appended depending on the particular function you're executing. Um, you can execute any function, in this case, the block aggregator get header uh, function to get the header for the validator um, client software. And so the results would then be served to the to the struct you have pointed to the core client. And so the function is executed in a safe um, space, um, in a safe environment 
through the the module registry and then it's it's um response written back through communication th um, by the core to your pointed address for um that type you have configured um you you just noticed like a small um uh, caveat about this um most of the results are wrapped in a list this is just to uh, um just to like protect the mutation of these um past payloads um between the the different modules since some may have very unique uh, martial methods um that may they that may result in like different structs um and different um json characters we we do not want to lose data or lose certain bytes of the payload itself and so many many of the results you notice are just wrapped around like an array of, of results and and it can quite easily be accessed for that particular results and so although this is just wrapped just to um ensure like that data integrity in in marshalling your your payload for communication across you can in a sense also write modules and configurations that can pass multiple um, arrays of data that must be written into um that you're expecting and similarly for the arguments pass different um, pointers and arrays of, of of data to to um, pass to the required method um, and so this this is also beneficial in in making these calls between modules and so from the builder api in the proposal requesting to get the header you come to the block aggregator which more or less manages the retrieval of the header between um, all of the connected modules so before we even get to how the he header is achieved, um, each module, after all of this core configuration and connection, each module can be written to stand alone, but in order to serve the validator clients, you can choose to still run your module and connect it as a microservice, but not serve um, blocks for that particular workflow um, through the block aggregator. And so to connect your module as let's say a relay module in this case, that would be provisioning blocks um, through like the external relays. You can connect the block aggregator through the connect block source um, method. Similarly, how you would call the block aggregator get header, you can call this block aggregator connect block source to connect your module. And then the block aggregator would aim to connect your module by identifying through the core, whether your module exists. So this name check is just to as a sanity check of of the the, the course knowledge uh, um, of all the modules to to verify whether the block aggregator can actually communicate to this module that intends to connect um, to it. So this sanity check is is just there necessary to ensure ensure this identification is is correct. Um, this is because maybe a module may 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 impose as a different uh, module trying to connect. Um, a block to the to the core. Um, we don't know that so many applications um, and and tooling can be written around this. And so to protect the integrity of the entire software, a few of these checks are made in place for both the command line flags and the block aggregator service, for instance. So this is just like almost like V zero of a few of the sanity checks that have been um, and security checks that have been integrated into the entire system um, in in starting up and being configured. But once this 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 source, let's say the the relay has been identified as a block source. Um, there are certain methods that the that particular block source must make ready or make exposed. One being the get header uh, method. And so what the core does is sorry, what the block ag aggregator does is in getting the header, it would of course make its own sanity checks, um, also as performed by the builder API. But then would process um, this this header request async to all connected block sources, and so not one module is more or less prioritized. All sources will get asynchronously requested for a header and waited for um, for a, a a a viable response. Now the the unique thing about the block aggregator is you can you can put um, larger um, more more complex logic into how you decide the best header for the builder API to to serve to the proposer, and in a sense, you can also um, configure an auction mechanism within 
this this block aggregator or within an external module that can then sift through the right block or the right payload for the builder um, for the builder API service. And so in all the modules um, being configured and executed to get their header, the block aggregator keeps knowledge of the, the requests that have been made to each of these modules and the and and where the the module would return the payload from when the block aggregator needs to get the module. So the header is a is a blinded um, version of the execution payload. So the of course transactions are not seen by the block aggregator at this point. Um, draws are not seen by the block aggregator at this point. But this get header request is necessary to establish a value for the builder API serve um, um, API service and then gets the block header to which the consensus layer clients would sign over as an acceptable block um, for, for that particular slot. And so in, in maintaining through this block aggregator service in maintaining the, the, the data integrity between all of these modules in one um, central point and um, easing, easing that, that complexity in the modules trying to like uh, gets value from a different module itself and compare value between the two. The builder, the block aggregator service does this um, to execute all modules concurrently to ensure fairness, ensure fairness, and then run um, the the process of getting the selected slot header when the modules are returned. And so for now, as mentioned before, this is just configured for um, the relay module. And so as the the results. Uh, so as as you can see, the results channel expands as as to um as and when you connect more block sources, and so there is actually a data allocation for every module to actually have an opportunity to present a block header or a data structure to the block aggregator for the builder API, to which then there is a for now a simple second uh, ascending second price auction for the highest. Uh, more or less header that will present the best um, value to the proposal. So in adding, ensuring that this is this is not computed just at the the end. In adding um, headers and not um, wasting resources, um, every header addition would have a comparison and a sorting for the highest header. But we don't discard. Um, headers which are of lower value. This is still maintained for each module. So each module has a represent a representation in the in the data structure stored for that slot. And any other module can then process logic um, out of that. And so selected slot headers has a list of slot headers which has a capacity for the amount of connected block sources which you can you can sort for the best, let's say in this case we are sorting for the best value. But you may have other applications that may sort, um, have other um, filtering mechanisms within the block aggregator uh, module itself, and so in processing every bid return from the results channel for all connected block sources, we can now safely get the selected slot header for um, the builder API, and so it's as simple as writing this function as you would normally write a function where you're returning the correct payload. And so in return the correct payload, you don't need to make a second call to the module that is requesting of um, information. The call clients would handle um, that waiting procedure. Th this, this call is not blocking to the whole software. It's, it will just halt the, the request um, for that particular AP, um, call client's RPC call until this function that you're trying to call returns a value or an error. So the function you write in each of your modules do not necessarily have to make a call back to the module that requested data from, but its data would be served and managed by the call client itself. And so in returning, let's say the required slot header and no error, the builder API is able to retrieve the right header for the proposal. I would very shortly like demonstrate what, what this entire workflow looks like. Um, similarly, the same process works for in getting the payload. So once the header is gotten by the validator software and signed over, the there's a need to expose the full payload to be proposed into the block. Some modules may not um, 
may not have like the full payload. Some modules we have the payload um split between different parties for security reasons. Um, some modules will have to request for the payload from the builder um itself just to, just so not to expose the 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 transactions within within the, the payload to avoid um, certain security flaws. Like let's say the PN module, um, for instance, the PN um relay module, for instance, will not take like the full payload and would would then request it back from the from the builder. So you can still have that that guarantee of of fairness within the entire ecosystem from from builders to relays and now to the validator proxy software itself. Yeah. Um, I so in PON we could even we could even um, yeah just thought about this in PON we could even do the RPBS verification so like the RPBS in in the proof of neutrality is the critical co commitment part of um as uh, the critical commitment part of the um of the proof of neutrality protocol and um um it's an interactive zero knowledge scheme that is currently being uh, verified at the, the relay level as for the credible commitment um, and is verified by reports, but it could also be in theory verified by the proposers through MEV plus as a module because we have a Golang um, RPVS verification. So that could definitely be a module, right? So then proposers get a higher assurance that they're indeed they're going to get paid. Um, but I mean, these are really good. Would, you, would it be worth maybe like as we wrap up to show like any, do you, do you have any like... Um, do you have the system running at all, like um, for the demo? Like, do, you, do you, any logs we can show, or like people can get an idea of uh, what to look at? Yeah, 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 I do. Um, and so yeah, in getting the payload, similarly in the in following the same spec, we would um identify the header that that was um selected from this this previous um leg of the of the the request, and then target that that specific module to return. The payload um back to the um to the validator client software, um and so yes you can indeed have modules that um let's say for PN a, a PN relay um relay collection module for instance that can then allow for ver um verification of the RPBS signatures by the validator itself and not even have to trust the the relay. To, to verify that for you in the first place. So you can still obtain and get full um, information of like signatures um, that you you as a validator want to be sure of and want to verify um, along with the headers that are presented to you. And so that's, that more or less summarizes what the, the block aggregator um, service is like. And so in, again, um, just back to the core and like what's, what the core would allow you to do. So I would just like quickly, just quickly demonstrate. Uh, one second. Bigger. Yes, and so it's, it's similarly as a a a module that you would write um within these modules, you would list your modules externally here, but the default services um can't quite easily just be switched off like that, and as such the 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 core would not um like you can still run your 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 software within your folder yourself, and as such the core will not expose anything of of the software you have built um and then let's just let me just demonstrate by removing removing just the builder api for instance as our our one of our default services so similarly for the command and then for the service that i just switched off for the builder api you can add your service and your command here in a similar manner. So for builder API that let's say we're not using um, by the core, it does not break core code. And so let's say if I rebuilt my core and then I run MVV plus help, I will now see, of course, my relay module and its services and configurations I can run and then block aggregator by no longer see the builder API service 
um, exposed. And so it's, it's that easy to just switch on and switch off anything you want at a time. Um, and so you can really just tailor and focus your software on exactly what you want to be running and building for. Just turn Builder API back on and then we'll just quickly demonstrate. And so in turning, let's say that's that module back on and let's say rebuilding the core. Of course, you don't really have to build every time you can directly run the mvplus.go file um, to run the CLI. And then if you run, let's say help of what, what the core is capable of, you will see the Builder API um, service is exposed and configured um, for MV+. And so um, in a sense, you have from Builder API through the block aggregator, which allow for, let's say an auction mechanism and an, let's say an auction duration from the slot start time to which every connected module it would seek a block from would have to wait to that auction um, um, time to ensure fairness uh, for, let's say, the different uh, applications and the different logic within all of these modules. Um, you can configure for the block aggregator that auction duration um, to which it would have to wait. Zero would mean instantaneous. So as soon as the validator calls for a block, um, it, all the modules will be requested for a block and whichever is the best value, not exactly a monetary value, any other value, for that particular validator would be selected instantaneously. And so to run MVV plus, um, to run MVV plus, you could, let's run plus. Yeah. So in running MVV plus, if you can still see my screen. You yeah, have... yeah, 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 can, can see it, yeah. Might yeah. have to do a part two here. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, if you show how to run it, and then we can we can do like a part two because we got to, got to maybe to close this by four. So, but if you show these logs, I think that's a good start. We can always go into any other detail later. But uh, let's 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 have a look at here. Let's see, what, what have we got here? So to run MV, MEV Plus, you essentially just run the the plus binary or in this case the file and configure each of your modules let's say be it the relay and module and its entries the builder api listening address let's say you want to check your relays for uptime um and then the block aggregator if you want to auction duration of let's say two seconds into the slot and so what happens is core does start by creating its own self and setting up the clients for each of these modules and then you can see it has successfully connected to the aggregator the relay and builder API, and then it starts any of their microservices that are available. So as mentioned before, the builder API is a server which would be started. And then the relay service, for instance, is another service as well. And so in the relay service starting, there are configurations that the relay possibly runs and connects the relays as, as checks for um, um, uptime checks on runtime. And then more or less your core is is ready to start. And so it, I mentioned that handshake between the block aggregator and a block source. Um, the relay in this self has identified itself as a potential block source for the validator and thus connect to the block aggregator um, by this means. And so once you have that done, the core is done and set up pretty much um, very lightweight, easy to start. Um, it depends on which modules you have plugged in. And so once you have it actually successfully running, um, you should see if I enter, for instance, our, M our, our MV plus running here. Oh, one second. And then I run MV plus here. You should see the same setup running within, let's say, the, the particular network you are connected to. And then your consensus layer clients requesting for, for block headers and payloads uh, from these different modules. So the, the communication between all these modules is almost very seamless um, in the sense that you should see a request for a header from the block aggregator. And then the relay handling this header request to any connected relays that have been specified, let's say your particular module. And now the block aggregator can identify the module that returned that header 
and then pass this header of a certain value. In this case, we have a, a relay that is, is re returning builder head, uh, blocks of, let's say, 0 0.04 ETH to the builder API successfully. And so now the builder API can then sign it and then request the payload um, through the builder API spec. And then, of course, the block aggregator would select the header that, uh, sorry, the payload, uh, retrieve the payload from that particular module and return it um, to the builder API for that specific value. And so these are how you would see and manage your, your particular uh, MVV plus resource and connected modules. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. I think there's a lot uh, of info to digest there, but the, the great thing about having this in a video format is that it can, um, you know, uh, you can pause it, run it at like slower speed and, and consume the information you need. I think people have information now on how to build the modules and uh, what MEV Plus is about. Um, uh, do you think there's any, like any kind of closing things, Matt, that you want to approach? Yeah, for this. Nothing specific, but it just like, as you said, there's a lot to digest here. Um, you know, um, I think it is, uh, how do we, how do we make this like in a more modular? How do we bring other modules? Like, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's it's very interesting from that standpoint. Um, the reason is we can have multiple modules run, but then there are key things that we discussed, like how we manage this network overhead, right? What you know, how we will not communicate all the things at the same time, but then there's um, isolated communication channels and focus topics, listening capability, and anyone can add or remove modules as they want. It's the base core remains as a very you know standard and builder API. It's basically built on top of what Ethereum has today, and just just making sure people can add more and more sidecars rather than building each and every sidecar. Just like plug it in, plug it in, plug it in, and then it just make it easy. I mean that's that's a, that's a great approach. Um, and the first speech at market, of course, that the the more important thing at the moment the validators want to talk is about the MEV, right? Um, when I say MEV, it's like how do I get more money for blocks proposing and, you know, syndication and all this kind of stuff. That's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Should, it should promote, uh, prompt some interesting like conversation, shouldn't it? And, and, you know, like, like we, we had in, you know, ETH Denver, if you look at our ETH Denver talks, we invited like open, open feedback, right. Around this. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. the door is open let's, for the conversation. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Uh, the whole concept here is like, you know, um, if you plant a seed in a pot, then it's really up to you. Um, you need to nourish it every single time. It's one single sidecar. But if you plant a seed in open ground, just like how the Ethereum garden philosophy, right? And then others, you know, it's the, the it's unbounded opportunity, and it can grow, and it can it can give shade to others, and it can it can become the 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 the, the pillar of attraction. Uh, but it's it's owned by everyone. It's you can you can take it. It's under a mighty license. There's no there's no restrictions in any way. Just use it and build it on top of it. This would be available on PO and PBS GitHub, right? Yeah. So um, yes. Yeah, so very shortly. So uh, yeah. So it's uh, yeah. GitHub.com PON dash PBS. Yeah. Yeah. Our neutral stack. Um, you know, offerings all all pushed there. Cool. All right. Thank you. So thanks guys. Thanks, Rose. Bye.